Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, co-founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. My guest today is 92-year-old atheist, author, and skeptical feminist Barbara G. Walker, who is going to tell it like it is about religion. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. I'm so pleased to welcome as Free Thought Matters guest, a wise woman, Barbara G. Walker. Barbara was originally known as a knitting expert writing classics such as Treasury of Knitting Patterns. Then she became the famed author of the monumental and best-selling Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, and at least 26 other books, including on feminism, free thought, titles such as The Skeptical Feminist, Man-Made God, Belief and Unbelief, and Feminist Fairy Tales. Barbara G. Walker is featured in FFRF's Anthology of Women Freethinkers, Women Without Superstition. She continues to write about the harm of religion at age 92, and it's so nice to welcome you to Free Thought Matters, Barbara. Hello, Annie Laurie. How are you today? I am fine. How are you? Well, I'm still thriving. And that's saying a lot at 92. Except for one leg and my ears. <laughs> so first, Barbara, uh, I do love the story that you have told me about how, as a child, you first started to doubt the claims of religion. Can you retell that? Okay. I've told that story many times. I was about six years old, and a dog that I loved very, very much had died. And our minister came to visit my mother, <clears throat> and I asked him how I would see my dog again in heaven. And he said I would never see my dog in heaven because dogs don't have souls, and God doesn't allow them in heaven. Well, I was overcome. He told me that I would see all my relatives in heaven instead because they're all human. And I started to cry, and I said, I don't want to see. I, I, I could trade a couple of aunts and uncles for my dog, can I? He said, no, that was impossible. So I ran away crying, and I say, I don't want to go to heaven. I think God is mean. And I ran away. <clears throat> and my mother, of course, made me come back and apologize. But I didn't apologize except in words. I really was very annoyed about that. And then when I went to Sunday school, I doubted all the things I was told. It didn't make sense. I thought God was pretty nasty about, for example, <clears throat> the example of uh, Abraham. Abraham was told to sacrifice his son because God demanded it. And I thought, if God told me to kill my child, what would I do? I would tell God to go to hell. <laughs> and of course, that kind of thinking was not going well. And finally, <clears throat> when I got to be a teenager, I read the Bible from cover to cover as I was, because I thought that's what I should do. 
And I was astonished. The God depicted in the Bible is a monster. He is cruel. He is fierce. He, he demands the, the elimination of whole cities, the killing of every man, woman, and child, and even every beast in the city. And he's um, the things that he asks people to do are incomprehensible. So <clears throat> the myth about Abraham, of course, was to show that you could substitute an animal for the son you were supposed to kill. And afterward, people did sacrifice animals. But God originally demanded a child. That's too much. Human or animal victims were apotheosized. And this was the moral equivalent of pond scum, and I, th I thought, to turn them into deities just because they were killed. So, Barbara, I remember a speech that you gave that we reprinted in Women Without Superstition, where you talk about entering Sunday school and being confronted with this life-sized crucifixion scene of torture. And, mm -hmm. and being told God decreed this should be done to his own son. And that you began to think in your childish way that the God who decreed all this was some kind of a lunatic. Indeed. If he was supposed to be all-powerful, he knew everything and had everything fixed the way he wanted in the first place. So why would there be these, all these mistakes? And I asked myself, if God is really so perfect, why isn't the world more perfect than it is? Well, then they came up with the devil idea. <clears throat> but God created the devil too. Not only that, but he created the worst concept of sadism ever, an entire eternal hell in which you would never stop suffering forever. What more richly sadistic idea could you get? I mean, this is the ultimate. And of course, um, if God didn't have everything he wanted the way he wanted, why not? Why would he give a human beings free will to oppose him if he didn't want that? It was made no sense at all. It was ridiculous. Barbara, you have criticized this common idea that we need to put the fear of God into children. Can you talk mm -hmm. about the harm that you see from that? <clears throat> well, putting the fear of anything into children is not a very cute idea. They do have to be aware of, of real danger, but God is not a real danger. God is an imaginary thing. Now, <clears throat> human beings are animals that are born more dependent than all other animals on Earth. They absolutely cannot do anything for themselves at all for a year or two before birth. They cannot even get themselves to the teeth because they're picked up and put to the breast by the mother. Everything they need in life is supplied by the mother, just like with other mammals. And the concept of a being who is bigger, stronger, wiser, knows what to do, knows what to teach you, that is inherent in the human brain. Um, I think that is because we are instinctively tuned to look to the mother, just as the mother instinctively looks after the baby. And that's so in, so in deep into the personality. It's, it's part of the original, the, the, the mind, the, the small brain, the central brain structure. So many <clears throat> people do not outgrow this need for a superior being to tell them what to do. It's part of their personality. They can't decide for themselves what exactly they need to do 
or not do to get along in life. And some of them never do learn. And some of them think they can only get the, the go-ahead from a superior being. So people invent gods. Originally goddesses, because they were all mother symbols. And then when patriarchy came along, unfortunately, mm -hmm. this great symbol of uh, help and sustenance and direction became male. However, <clears throat> it doesn't make sense because the male is not the, the creature that takes care of you when you're dependent. That's, that usually is the mother. Male animals are made to compete. Female animals are made to take care. And so the original deities of humans were, were goddesses. So we saw a patriarchal reversal, and that kind of segues nicely to my next question, which is, Barbara, most of your books and essays have touched on religious hatred of women and religion's mistreatment of women. And I wonder if you could talk about that today in terms of, of what's going on in the United States, Poland, our, our Iran theocracies. For 5,000 years, there was the Inquisition in Europe, which killed <clears throat> more than 9 million women recorded and possibly millions of others that never got, never got talked about. The sadism inherent in the idea of, a, of an inquisition is incredible. Um, practically every woman that was taken in to the inquisition prisons was raped before going to the torture chamber and everyone admitted to being a heretic or a witch because they couldn't do otherwise. They were tortured until they said it. Then they were burned. Now, <clears throat> as to the Inquisition, the reason the church forbids suicide, even today, is that the rule was made that if the accused knowing he, was, he or she would be arrested, uh, committed suicide in order to avoid the torture chamber, the church could not take their property. They had to have an ambition of guilt before they could take the property, which they usually did right away, as fast as possible. And it was all these admissions of guilt that made the church the richest organization in Europe. And <clears throat> Christian churches altogether are still the richest conglomerate, conglomerate of organizations in the world. And all the money they take in is tax untaxed, so they can spend it any way they want. They claim to be um, helping people but actually, the money they spend in helping people is much less than the money they spend helping themselves. I am talking with author and skeptical feminist Barbara G. Walker. And after this break, Barbara, I'd like to um, ask more about your advice for longevity and your perspective as a 92-year-old woman living in these times. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. 
please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Gabrielle Hanahara, um, and I'm an atheist because I believe in the power of doing good for the sake of doing good, and not because some divine entity tells you what is good and what's not, um, and not because you think it will get you into some sort of heavenly afterlife. Uh, I believe in human morality, um, which is why I think that most cultures across the world have come to the kind of same basic principles and values, such as the golden rule, which isn't based in religion, but is based in human interactions um, and mutual respect. And I think a lot of people turn to religion because it makes the choice of morality really easy, black and white, right and wrong, and you don't have to decide which is which. And in my experiences being an atheist through my life, I've found that um, moral choices are something that I think about a lot more than a lot of other people because nobody's telling me the answer. Um, and since I don't believe in an afterlife, pretty much my whole meaning in life is based on uh, my interactions with other people and that I can leave this world a better place by my actions. I'm interviewing Barbara G. Walker, author of The Skeptical Feminist and many other books, including Man Made God. Barbara, before we get back to the topic of religion and what's wrong with it, do you have advice for longevity? How, how do you stay so fit and healthy? I think it's probably because all my life I've been physically very active. I have climbed mountains and gone hiking and biking every day. And up until three years ago, I was riding my bike six miles a day, every day. And um, I fell off the bike and it was afflicted with neuropathy, which is why I'm now kind of limited in my movements, to say the least. But I think a lot of it has to do with regular exercise and not overeating, of course. Um, to keep active, keep doing things. I have no more complicated offer to make. Well, very good advice. And I would also love to hear your thoughts as a 92-year-old about the world today, especially what's going on in the United States with abortion rights and the Supreme Court. Are, are you feeling discouraged, disgusted, or do you feel hope? Disgusted is the word that I would use to describe it. The idea that we are going in extreme right wing again after what I thought was a, a, an improvement is pretty discouraging. I mean, what happened to the Woodstock generation? Why are they now turning to the, the far right again? And seeing religion taking back, uh, what it, trying to take back what it had before is very discouraging. I am particularly sorry for the grandchildren of today's generation because I think they're going to have a very difficult world to deal with. And it's, it's not going to be easy. <clears throat> also, we have the thought, the threat of global war hanging over us all the time because patriarchal societies are aggressive and they kind of like making war because they have this huge, expensive war machine that's supported by more than half of our taxes, and they have to use it somehow. I have a lot of, a lot of doubts about the future, and I'm sort of glad that I'm not going to live to see it. Well, speaking of that, uh, what are your views on on medical aid in dying and death with dignity and, and being in control of your own death? I think it's pretty in inevitable. Um, I would like, I have my body assigned to uh, medical science because I know that medical students are in need of cadavers. And not only that, but it costs nothing. And funerals are just ridiculous. I mean, why should people get together 
to praise a dead person who can't appreciate it anymore. <laughs> it's so absurd. True. So I'm doing with my body what I think should be done with more, most bodies, donating it to science. Barbara, why do you reject the concept of an afterlife, which so many believers seem to find comfort in? And why is that belief cold comfort? I have no idea why people are so afraid of death as to invent an afterlife. It, it seems silly. We know, we can see with our eyes and ears that every living thing lives for a while and then disappears. And its mass, its atoms, return to become other creatures and other things and other plants. Bodies become worms, become grass, become soil, and that helps to nurture further life. It's a, a gigantic cycle. It seems only natural that bodies simply disappear and decay, including the brain, which is where you have all your fantasies and all your thoughts and all your religion, which exists nowhere but in your imagination. It is perhaps the greatest scam ever invented because they are selling for gigantic prices nothing. And yep. they, have, they never have to keep their promises. They can make all the promises in the world. They have no obligation because there's nothing there to keep. Because it's all make-believe. Oh, yes, of course. It's not non-existent. But you could you can sell make believe for such enormous amounts of money. You're really going to make money. It's a very rich scam that they're carrying on. So Barbara, one one good change in our country is the growing numbers of people who identify as atheists, agnostics, or nothing in particular. And we do see an all-time low in people identifying as Christian. So that's very good news. Yes, I'm very happy to see that more and more people are perfectly willing to admit that they're, Christ they're atheists. Um, when I was a child, it was not admitted very easily because it was mean that you would be, um, I don't know, ostracized or something. But today, People call themselves nuns, N-O-N-E-S, meaning they have no religion at all, which is fine. Atheism is not a religion. Atheism is simply a, meaning no in Greek, theos, meaning no God. It has nothing to do with ritual or ceremony or music or any of the things that the church has adapted into their own, um, their own advertising, so to speak. But uh, we do, at the same time, have a resurgence of Christian nationalism in our nation. And mm -hmm. what, what can be done to fight Christian nationalism and help defeat religion's hold on our species? All we can do is exactly what you are doing publish as much as possible that points out its flaws, um, keep it, elect politicians who don't claim to be downright Christian, and keep the money from flowing into the wrong places. By wrong places, I mean the churches and their administration. I think we have time for, for one more question uh, to you, Barbara. I wonder if you could talk about the doctrine of original sin, which is a doctrine that I particularly dislike. Of course. It, it's often a self-fulfilling prophecy. C could you talk about that? Every woman should abhor the doctrine of original sin because that was devised by the Catholic Church to blame Eve for all the sins in the world and let Adam go free. So. Women were looked upon as basically evil by the church for a very long time, many centuries. And they are put down in such a way by religion 
that they feel that there's something really wrong with them and they have to be obedient and they have to be subservient and they have to regret their own existence. And this is a foul thing to have to impose on women for so many centuries. Original sin is a terrible idea. And <laughs> worshiping an instrument of torture, that is a Christian church, Christian cross, on which a man died in, in agony, is worshiping a patriarchal symbol because it originally, way back in Hinduism, the cross represented male genitals. And so it became a male symbol. The oval, of course, was the female symbol. But these, the whole idea of original sin, blaming it on women, is a terrible patriarchal idea. It underlies all of patriarchal religion. And it makes men able to put women down in various inhuman ways. And therefore, it is, should, be should be eliminated altogether. I think the church is learning that they can't emphasize this anymore too much because it's a very hateful idea. But they haven't really gotten rid of it. So it's still there and it's still possible to use it. So well, speak, speak out against that particularly. Well, thank you so much, Barbara, for everything you've done to speak out and educate. And it's been an honor to spend time with you today. Well, I recommend the website called bgw.works if you would like to learn more. And to viewers of Free Thought Matters, thank you for watching because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.